let's look at a probe for an oscilloscope. That's very practical and see what we can, uh, uh, what we can say about tuning such a probe. Here is the equivalent circuit. The voltage source with a 50 ohm is my signal source, uh, 50 ohm, and I connect it to the probe, and the probe has uh, one mega ohm plus 90 PF, which is the total capacitance of the cable and the input of the oscilloscope, and it has nine meg and 10 PF, which is the uh, tuned capacitance of the, uh, at the input. So the total impedance is about 10 mega ohm and about 9 PF of the probe, and it attenuates 10 times frequency independent, as we will see later. Let's make the resistance network. So then we have two ports. C1 is connected across 9 mega ohm. You see 50 ohms is just connected to ground because the impedance of the voltage source is zero. I'm going to look at the poles. I don't need the zero, the voltage itself. So the 50 ohm is connected to zero. That's why we use these symbols for voltage sources. You see, you always have the impedance. You leave out the circle, you have the impedance. And we do the same for current sources. You leave out the circle, you have the impedance, which is infinite. So here, um, 50 ohm to ground, 9 meg across the port, and then we have 1 meg across the second port, and both ports are in series connected in parallel with the 50 ohm, exactly as here drawn in this network. So the error matrix, the R matrix, we can now just, you know, you can put an ohmmeter there, but you can also calculate it. Let's say what will be the on-diagonal resistance of port 1. We have 9 mega ohm in parallel, with a series connection of one meg and 50 ohm. That's exactly what this expression on place one one shows you. What is the measure, the impedance that you would measure, uh, the resistance that you would measure at port two? It is one mega ohm in parallel with nine meg in series 50 ohm. Well, that is exactly what you see in position two two. What will be the off diagonal? Now, remember, if we have if we connect the vo the current source so that we have the plus and minus voltages defined as set, then the conversion will be negative. If you put a current across in in port one, then the voltage in port two will be negative, and you can calculate it. And the transfer is given by the off diagonal element and the network is passive, it's re reciprocal, and also this uh, uh, R matrix is then a symmetrical matrix. What is a C matrix? A C matrix tells me there is 10 PF connected to port one, and there is 90 PF connected to port two. So there you only have diagonal, diagonal elements telling you which capacitance is connected to which port. So the RC matrix is both matrices multiplied, and I can calculate the eigenvalues of this time constant matrix and find P1 is 1768 hertz and P2 is 353.7 megahertz. Of course, with a minus sign. But that was not our intention. Our intention was not to calculate these eigenvalues. No, our intention was to estimate it. Now think of the following experiment. Let's just look at my R matrix and first connect C1 to it, C1, and then just calculate the time constant. Then I have a time constant, a discharge path for C1 as if there is no C2 connected. So assuming there will be no uh, uh, C2 uh, charge going to, to C2. I can also do it the other way around. I can also put C2 on port 2 and measure its discharge time. It will discharge over this 1 mag in parallel with 9 mag plus 50 ohm as if there is no charge flowing to C1. Basically, I'm then calculating only this term the first, the one, one term of the R matrix times 10 PF and the two, two terms of the R matrix times 90 PF, only the diagonal elements. 
and skip the two off-diagonal elements. So that would then, if those two off-diagonal elements would be very small, would be zero, then hopefully you know from linear algebra that the eigenvalues are equal to the, are found on the on the on the diagonal. So that is really simple. Um, but you can also see, let's say, the, the, the C1 would then be discharging over this resistor, which is the pole frequency, and C2 would then discharge over this uh, 1 mega ohm in parallel with 50 and 9 meg, which would be another pole frequency. But what if at while one capacitor is discharging, another one is taking almost all the charge? That would mean that such a pole would the voltage would not longer change with the charge if it is taking all the charge then it, it, let's say let's put a very huge capacitor on uh, on port number two then and a small capacitor on port number one then let's say if i am discharging c1 which is maybe a little bit charge put on it then there will be the same amount of charge can maximally go to the other capacitor, but the voltage hardly doesn't, doesn't change because it's much larger than the other one, which means, in fact, that the port is shorted. So, now I have a procedure. I calculate first both time constants or the time constants, you could say, at all the ports. Then start with the largest time constant because then other ports cannot be a short because I have the potential short for other ports. And then after I have said, well, then the dominant time constant, this will be the dominant pole, then I short this pole to calculate the other time constants. And that is basically what you are also doing if you build up intuition. If you build up intuition, you're putting capacitors there and just see where the charge is flowing. And if the charge is flowing and you are measuring, oh, then this resistor is taking, is dissipating all the charge. And then that capacitor with that resistor together form the pole, because that's the physical mechanism. You know, it, the system went to its quiescent state. If one thing was having energy, the capacitor, and it was losing its energy, dissipating it over some resistance. Let's see how it works for the probe and see if we can somehow approximate these values in this way. So here we have the probe again, here we have the circuit, here we have our network, here we are going to connect 10 PF to this port. 10 PF gives us 10 PF times nine meg in parallel with uh, 50 ohm plus one meg, which is about 900 K, gives a time constant of nine microsecond about. Now remove this capacitor and place the 90 PF there. Then we have 90 PF over one Mac in parallel with uh, nine Mac and 50 Ohm, um, which is about uh, 900 K uh, also. And it gives us 81 microsecond because the capacitor is much larger. This would then be the dominant pole. So this is the largest time constant. And this pole is 1965 Hertz. Now look at the previous result. Oh, oh, oh that's a little bit too previous. Oh, I had it before, was it? Here, we had 1768 Hertz. And we have now, sorry, 1968. 1965 hertz so we are 180 hertz off about uh so that's well a nice estimation i would say and i'll look at the second poll for the second poll i say well now this time constant was much shorter so say that this port is shorted because if this one is losing charge is losing its charge, it will charge the 90 PF a little bit, but the voltage doesn't change so much. So it appears as if the port is shorted. And then I have this circuit. And then I could calculate the pole from 50 ohm in parallel with 9 mega ohm. And that would give me 318 megahertz, 
which is not so far off. And if you calculate the product of the poles, it will be about the same as the, uh, as the real the poles calculated from the eigenvalues, but the sum will be a little bit different. The sum will be a little bit uh, affected by the interaction of the two of the two capacitors. But this still, it was not, let's say I wasn't, it wasn't my intention to calculate the poles, let's say in three digits. No, I can now say, okay, so there is one pole originating from, let's say, 10 pf and um, and about 50 ohm because 9 meg and 50 ohm is nothing and there's another one and that is originated from about 1 meg and 90 p well that is 900 k but that's not a big difference so i know the dominant pole is caused by this 90 pf and the non-dominant pole is caused by the 10 pf ignoring the interaction between the two, but giving me a very good estimate. And this is a very nice basis for intuition. Why? Because let's say I can really think about where is the charge flowing? Put just in your, in your, uh, in your thoughts, put, put some charge on this 90 PF and see where it flows. I say, well, this, predominantly flows in the one Mac. So this is, uh, and almost nothing comes to this. Well, you can also say, well, there's only 50 ohm here. 10 PF appears to be maybe in parallel with 9 PF. Okay. Of course, there are more uh, approximations uh, possible, but they will also be inaccurate. So if you do 100 PF with 90 K, then this one will be even, even, even be a little bit lower frequency. You can also calculate the series connection of 10 PF and 90 PF over 50 ohm. You say, oh, the resistors don't matter anymore. Let's say here we have the two in series and 50 ohm. That will bring this a little bit to a higher frequency, but we're talking about 10%. So if the, in, if the interaction between those networks is not that large, then you can have a fair estimation of the poles and in any case, you can estimate which pole is connected to which capacitor. And that is a way to build up, uh, let's say, intuition about estimating poles and zeros from networks.